So Simon Jenkins, thank you for joining us very much today. And we have you as a franchisor, but you've been a franchisee. And the theme of this thing is to talk about redundancies and, and when someone's made redundant, what do they do and what are the options for them? So maybe you want to talk a bit about your journey before gyms and what brought you to gyms mowing. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I spent uh, 20 years working in the financial services industry um in a, in a range of different roles over that time uh for the gfc i got made uh redundant as a result of the gfc and i then spent uh, i suppose a good six months looking around for other work in uh in a similar sort of in that financial services space now during that during that time i discuss i wasn't a lot of job opportunities around and I started to go back to one of my I guess dreams of being able to run my own business and it was at that point that I then started to look at all the different options that were around. Um, one of the options that I did look at was uh, another franchising option which was looking at being a franchisee of a one of the small regional bank branches and um, I very quickly dismissed those fundamentally because of the monthly cost the amount that you could be on the hook for in a month was approaching sort of $40,000 a month. So, it, you know, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble quite quickly if you, uh, if you don't that. So then I started to look at smaller fields and then I started to look at the franchising opportunities. And um, uh, I, I guess, and then as part of that, I then sort of started to narrow it down as to what I could build a business out of. So when I was looking at different things, I, I looked at the handyman side of things, but my thoughts around that were you needed carpentry skills. While I had basic carpentry skills, I didn't have extensive carpentry skills and very difficult to be able to expand that business and be able to employ staff. And so I started then to look more closely at the gardening and the mowing side of things. Um, from there, I then started to look at the different models that each of the um, franchisors was offering in and around Sydney. And um, eventually I, I chose gyms. And I, I guess there were two things that, that drew me to, to gyms in particular. The first thing was the freedom for me to be able to run very much my own business, be able to set my own price, the working hours, the areas that I wanted to work. Um, all of that sort of thing was very much in terms of mine. And the second part was the fact that it was a fixed monthly fee with the exception of, of leaves, the amount of work that comes in. I knew what I was going to be up for each month. It wasn't going to vary. And I could have employed, you know, uh, six people and it would still be the same monthly fee as if it was a one person. So that's kind of how I ended up with gyms. It was a bit of a process of elimination. Yeah, now you've, thanks for that detail, Simon. And you've obviously come from a very high corporate background so how was that time of the uncertainty because I know that might be coming up to a lot of people with the economy and stuff in the next year or two so was it something where you had a bit of a buffer where you could take a bit more time to make assessments or what do you recall that uh, yes like? look I, I was fortunate I'd spent 20 years with the one organization so when I was made redundant I absolutely had a financial buffer that was there um, I also have um, a wife who was also able to work during that time as well so um, but I, I will say that, you know, you get pretty bored and want to start doing something after, after six months of, um, of not being able to, to work as such, um, you certainly start to look at all those sorts of things. And so, uh, yeah, it, look, I, I spent probably two to three months researching um, before I made the initial in, inquiry, looking around all of the different options that were available. So, um, um, yeah, it is, it, is, it is a scary time. Um, but yes, that was that was sort of part of it. Is that it, it, I did take my time in being able to do it, but I was fortunate that I could. And you said your dream was to run your own business. So what was what was appealing about it for you? You mentioned it before, but what was the, what was the dream for you? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess it, it, in in very simple terms, it's I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. Um, working in the corporate environment. Um, there's a there's a very firm set of rules that you have to follow and you know you have to go about things in a particular way um even though you might not want to go go about them in that way um and while gyms has some hard and fast rules they're not particularly onerous um and they're predominantly around a quality of work 
and just keeping in contact with your customers. And, you know, if you can do those two simple things, uh, then it's, it's, it's quite easy. So it was really just about being able to control my own destiny and just be able to, to do things the way I wanted to be able to do them without the pressure of having someone looking over my shoulder. And how have you found the change or how did you make that transition from employee to business owner? How is it for you? Um, actually, I found it relatively easy. Um, probably the only um, issue is, uh, it, it, is in starting is in people to talk to. Um, and that's where you just need to make sure that you've got other people to talk to, whether they be other franchisees or just other people that you can, that you can talk to during the day if you need to just pick up the phone. So um, your customers, uh, once they get to know you, will always be up for a chat if they're around. And let's talk about the training experience. So you've come from the corporate environment and it's, you know, it can be very scary to come from New South Wales down to Victoria. So do you recall your training experience and what was that like? I do indeed. Um, I've been with gyms long enough though that I was um, able to do my training in New South Wales. I didn't actually do the training through the, through the gyms group in Melbourne. So um, <clears throat> we did that. Look, I spent a week's training in at um, in Sydney. It was Castle Hill. And the, I think we had about 10 other franchisees that were in there at the same time. Um, I found that excellent. It gave great knowledge. And uh, some of the tips and hints that the presenters used, I still use today. So Yeah, I forgot about that. But yeah, Peter and Chris, that, yeah, I forgot about that. I should have remembered that. <laughs> Been around for a while. They have indeed. Um, yes, and so have I. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense now. But um, with the um, now you're a franchisor, maybe do you want to explain to people um, what a franchisor is and what your role is? Yes, certainly. So I'm um, I'm actually both a working franchisee and a franchisor. So that means I still have my mowing business, which is Jim's Mowing North Sydney, and I still um, on the tools, so to speak, four days a week with that. Um, but then uh, about two years ago, Marisa, uh, my wife, and I decided that we would also. Um, become franchisors. So we look after all the franchisees who are in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and the lower north shore of Sydney. And so we provide support to all of those franchisees. So it can be as simple as last week, one of them called up, had, had cut a um, watering system hose accidentally and went, what do I do here? Very simply be able to say, yep, yeah, it's a common occurrence. What you need to do is with this, with that, with that, and then you're able to fix it and get, get on with it. Um, I'm available also as a franchisor to help with quotes uh, in terms of if you don't know how to, how to quote a particular job, I can come out, have a look at the job and walk you through the steps that you need to go to, to be able to work out how much you could charge for it um, and what the pitfalls are. And that's probably the main thing is providing assurance particularly when you're new in terms of what can go wrong and just the things to be able to watch out for. And the fact that we've pretty much all done them for ourselves before. Um, it's just a matter of how you approach then being able to fix them in terms of um, also we have regular meetings so that we actively encourage the franchisees in the local area to get together in meetings so they can talk but also so they recognise each other when they're out on the road, but also so they've got somebody else to be able to call and ask advice if they want to talk to someone else. Because the great thing about the gym's, well, the gym's model, in my view, is that there is not just one right answer. There is the right answer for each individual business. And um, the way I do things is one way of doing it. There are absolutely other ways of doing things as well. That's some fantastic points about it. Now, do you recall back when you made the transition from the corporate environment to being physical in the field? What was that transition like? Because we have a lot of blokes who come from the corporate world and do that transition. So maybe you want to paint a picture for them about they might have to do a bit of hard yakker in the early days making that transition. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, you know, coming from a corporate, corporate environment, um, you know, people panic when the air conditioning is slightly out of kilter. Um, you know, uh, I'm recording this in summer in Sydney at the moment. The humidity outside is at about 90% and it's about 32 degrees. It is absolutely stinking hot out there. So you will have hot days. Um, and physically, yes, you will be tired. There's absolutely no way, no way ar around that. But you very quickly get used to it. Um, and it, it, it really doesn't take long. 
look, the, um, you know, some of the hot days, you do need to stay hydrated. Absolutely. That's one of the big things. And again, as part of training, there's some tricks and then there's tips around, around that that we can help you with to make sure that you do it and that you watch for the signs of it and that, that you stop. So, yeah, look, physically it can be, it can be hard, but it, I guess it's not heavy work. Um, if you're a builder's labourer, as an example, you will be working for someone and you will spend your entire day moving a pile of dirt from point A to point B, carrying heavy loads. That's not what we do. We are far more into the maintenance side of things. So we're using tools to be able to minimise that. You know, you can have um, lawnmowers that are self-propelled that can help you pull you through. Or if it's a small property, you can have a much smaller one. You've got your equipment is relatively light in the scheme of things. Most things come out in about five kilos, you know, so they're relatively easy to be able to carry and walk around. You are on your feet, but then again, you also get a break when you go from one job to another. So it is your business. If you're feeling tired, you slow down or you stop, make contact with your customers, say, hey, I'm not going to get there today. It's just too hot. And 99 times out of 100, they're absolutely fine with that. But it's, a, it's also, I guess, it's a good workout as well. You know, you've achieved something. I think with the mowing guys, people don't realize you get multiple times a day job satisfaction where you can see the job from start to finish, which a lot of people don't enjoy that at all. Oh, absolutely. It, it's, um, and every time I talk to, um, uh, to people who are starting, and I, and I do tend to forget about it, I guess I take it for granted, is you will turn up and a place will not necessarily be looking messy, but it will be looking untidy. You will leave and it will be looking tidy. You get that job satisfaction every single day. If you do 10 jobs in a day, you get job satisfaction 10 times in that day. So you get a real sense of accomplishment and achievement every time, you're, every time you finish a job. And how have you found your overall well-being? You know, can you recall back to the corporate days compared to now? What's the difference? Um, every time I'm asked this, I go back to, um, I was out at the pub with a group of friends and, and my sister was there and then, and someone said, oh, how are you enjoying it? And, you know, has it been good for you? My sister piped up, and this was probably about three or four years in, and she said, oh, he's never been happier um, as a result of it. Um, look, every job has its stresses, but the types of stresses were, were far less. And um, you're in control of your own destiny. So you don't have to, um, it, you know, the decisions that you make are the decisions you make. And, um, you know, you've, you normally you make them knowing full well what the consequences are going to be. Um, and it's so much better. So I absolutely... Um, a, do not miss my corporate days at all. I was going to say, do you want to give some idea to people about how big you can build a business? So are there any franchisees in your region who've got a really big operation or yourself or maybe do you want to give some Yeah, so about? look, I guess I'll, I'll talk about myself and then I can talk about a, a, a couple of the others. Um, and it's, it's probably an important point with, with gyms. I started by myself with no customers. Um, by the end of the first year, I had sufficient work and customers that I needed to have someone help me um, every day of the week. So, you know, that took, that took 12 months. Um, I started in August and as I came out of winter the second time, I knew I needed someone to be able to get through that spring and summer. So it can be that quickly to be able to do it. You can build it up a little bit faster than that if you want to, but that was my, that was my process. Um, in the end of the second year, I had a second vehicle on the road with somebody else in it. And I continued that for a period of time. I eventually had six people working for me at the, at the peak. Um, but then I started to, to scale that down um, in terms of, um, uh, I guess, getting, getting the right people to run my vehicles was probably the, uh, the trickiest part of that. And so I then started to sort of scale that back down again. And then when I decided to take on the franchise or side of things, um, the person who was that stage running my second vehicle had decided to retire. He'd been with me for over 10 years. And so I then decided that's it. I'm going to wind that side of the business back. So you can grow as much as you like or as, uh, or you can stay as a one man band. There's no, there's no sort of set. And in fact, different times of your journey, you can go up or you can come down just depending upon individual circumstances. Uh, in, in terms of that. So um, then we also have, um, we have an, another guy who is in the Eastern suburbs. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of guys in the Eastern suburbs who are relatively young and they're in under two years and they have up to nine and 10 employees working for them. 
at the moment. One of, one of them, so, Connor. Connor. Connor is indeed one. Of them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Connor is uh, Connor is absolutely one of those. Um, and again, they um, the only thing holding them back is is staff. And look, the last two years with COVID have been tricky in terms of that. It's still not easy to find staff. It's easier than it was twelve months ago, um, but it's not. We're not quite there yet. Um, in the normal course of business, I would have a relationship with a temporary agency. I could have called them up. If I called them up by midday today, I could have someone available tomorrow morning. So that was that's what I would call business as normal. Um, we have obviously haven't had that for the last two years. Yeah. What's your key to finding good staff then? What were some traits? Because I know it's a problem for a lot of franchisees and it seems to be the one, the main problem that stops a franchisee from scaling is, is the employee problem. So what was your tip to find a good staff or what are some, what's some advice around that? Uh, look, it is, it, don't close any avenue. Um, my, my, my focus was I wanted someone who I could trust their quality. So for me, the quality of their work was more important than the speed of their work. So that was my focus on finding someone who was, um, who was older. Um, hence, you know, after 10 years, he decided to retire um, from doing this type of work. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, so, look, it's, it's fine. I have used uh, recruitment agencies. Um, haven't had a huge amount of success to recruitment agencies. Um, I have had some good success with the employees through some of the disability providers. Um, if you if you talk to them about what your needs are and what people's needs are, um, they can they can be excellent. I've had some excellent people from with an Aboriginal background also as well come through. The advantages of both of those um, uh, types of employees is they come with support workers. So that first three to six months, there is also someone else helping them and coaching them through getting uh, being an employee and working with that. And there's also training and, and wage subsidies that are available through some of those schemes as well. Um, and just ask around the local community. You know, you will find things. Um, the uh, I'm well past my football playing days, but um, certainly if you are associated with any sort of a sporting club, um, anything along those lines, then they are absolutely a source of people. Or if you know somebody who's at university, you can get lots of um, lots of people who are looking for one to two days of work a week. Um, and then particularly when holidays are on, which generally speaking is when we're busiest, then they're also available to be able to do that as well. So it tends to be a, a full range of, um, of, of, where, of where to get people. Um, once you get a good one, you hold on. Now, some really good advice there. So how do you hold on to good ones? What, what, what are some <laughs> things you do to help hold on to them? Uh, it, it's, it's to work out what they want. It's to really work out what they value. Um, and it is not always a paycheck. That's certainly part of it. Um, but often it's, if you dig down, it's the people I need to get away by three o'clock or I want to, I, every, every week I really like to do this. So can I knock off at such and such a time? You, if you're flexible about how you deal with your staff, that's probably the most important thing. Um, and then, and then pay them, obviously you have to pay them fairly. Um, and, and as I, and you know, if they're, if they're running their own vehicle, there are allowances and extra things that they, they do need to be paid as a result of that. Um, but don't underestimate if they can take the vehicle home for the night uh, is also, also a benefit as well for them because they don't need to have a second vehicle, a second car at home to get to work. A lot of good advice there. I was just going to ask you now, transitioning to something else about the services we do. So maybe yes. you want to talk, what are some big misconceptions maybe that customers have about Jim's Mulling, you reckon? Uh, the single business misconception is that we do gardening uh, as well as mowing. Um, that's the, um, a lot of people go, yes, of course, I know that. But then there are people who go, oh, I thought you just did mowing. So that's probably the, the biggest area that we, that we face. Um, in, in terms of other services that people are not really so much aware about, I would call would be gutters. Um, certainly in the mowing division, we do pressure washing of driveways and um, courtyards and paved areas and those sorts of things. And, uh, and the soft landscaping. And by soft landscaping, mulching of garden beds, um, uh, replanting of turf, those sorts of things. Um, when you start to get into what 
hard landscaping, which is paving and uh, retaining walls and those sorts of things, there are legal requirements about how much of that you can do depending upon which state you're in. So, um, but they're the, they're the sorts of things, but with pressure washing and gutter cleaning, certainly in a Sydney environment, we save those up for winter. So as the lawn start or the grass starts to slow down in terms of its growth, we can then start to talk to our customers about, well, it's coming up to autumn and winter. As soon as the autumn leaves have finished falling, we should get up there and clean your gutters so they're right for the next 12 months. Um, and then once you've done that, you can then say, and look, it's starting to get slippery. The moss starts to develop on pavers. We can clean that up so that you've got a safer surface during uh, for the remainder of the year. So you can do those things. But yeah, the big thing is gardening uh, in terms of that. And a lot of people um, are quite scared about approaching gardening, but that's where your franchisors can help you in terms of advice with that. Some of the training courses that we offer and some of the, just the, the experience of those working franchisees and franchisors can provide you. Fantastic. Now, maybe because you've obviously been a franchisee yourself, maybe you want to give a bit of insight to people. How did you build your business in the early days? Was it something where you have to do take work from bigger areas than what you normally would or you do the door knocking or how did you build your business in the early days? Yeah, look, certainly. I, I spent the first 12 months um, uh, traveling in, in, in quite a large area within uh, within within Sydney. Um, and at the end of that 12 months, as I said, I was able to get an employee to be able to help me out. I then started to shrink that down quite dramatically. So um, if I think about sort of a circle from where my home was, I might have been traveling 20 kilometers as the crow flies to be able to do some of my outlying jobs. Um, and over, over a period of two to three years, I shrunk that down. And as the crow flies, it would be no more than probably five kilometers from home now, that where I've got 95% of my customers. I still have a few outliers in terms of that. So I started out in a much bigger area and I condensed that down to a smaller, a smaller area. Um, and, you know, one of the advantages is if I knock off work at four o'clock, I'm home at four, four o five. Um, by being able to by being able to do that um, in, in terms of just just being able to to sort of go around. Um, I, I built it, built the business up through a combination of um, certainly getting leads through gyms, but then also getting referrals from uh, my existing customers, neighbors, friends, um, in that sort of thing, so that very quickly I was able to build up build up a business and then continue building that up just through probably 50% of my customers now um, come, in fact, uh, probably for the last five years, at least 50% of my customers have come from referrals from my existing customers. Which is the best type of lead is the referral, isn't it? So It is indeed. Yep, no, absolutely. So uh, the advantage of it is, is that customer already has an idea of what your price point is. Mm. Um, now, do, so now, that, sorry. No, sorry, you go, you go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one, one of the things is um, you, you will decide on what your, what your hourly rate is that's going to work for yourself, how much you're going to be able to do and the value that you can add to that. And um, my advice is always to stick to that. Um, and that's where, you know, people coming in through the call centre and things may not know what that's going to be, but anyone that comes through from a referral already has an idea of what your pricing is going to be like. Mm, that's some good advice. Now, I was going to ask you about Body Corps real estate agents. Obviously, you would have dealt with a lot over the years. What's the advantage for a body corp or for a real estate using Jim's mowing over, let's say, another provider, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I, I probably have, um, I've got four real estate agents that I do work for. Um, and I have probably, I think it's closer to 10 strata plan companies that I do work for. And the advantage of for, for them is, is if you can get your name as Jim's Mowing onto their list, we are deemed to be completely independent of both the real estate agent and the strata manager. So when customers go, oh, can to a strata manager, can you get me a couple of quotes? They will go, yep, bank, and I can get you as Jim's one of Jim's Mowing as one of those. We automatically are deemed to be independent of that strata manager or that real estate agent because we are a known brand outside of that. So you leverage off the, our brand to be able to get into those people and people automatically go, oh, good. I, I know I'm getting someone reliable and I know I'm going to get something with quality so that we can be in there um, 
and and get it. And you know, look, that's it's fantastic business when you get a strata manager who just sends you an email and says, "Hey, Simon, can you go and do a quote at such meet so and so and do a quote?" It it becomes very easy. That's no, really good advice. I've never, never heard it said like that before. I never thought of it like that before. So it's definitely a um a really good really good benefit. But I don't want to ask you about your equipment. So we always have interest about people's equipments, and there's all these different thoughts on what you should run: petrol, battery, or not a bit of both. So what what are you running at the moment in your setup? Everything. <laughs> um, so I have uh, just a you know on a, on a on a day to day basis, I have one petrol lawnmower, I have one battery lawnmower, I have um, a petrol whipper snipper, I have two telescopic battery powered hedge trimmers, and one petrol um, smaller handheld one. Uh, I do run um, petrol power blowers. Um, I do have one battery powered blower in terms of that. Um, and that's my that's my basic sort of equipment pack in terms of that. Um, why the combination? Um, I, I guess most importantly, I don't buy new equipment until I need to. I, I don't go out there for the fun of it and just do it. So as a piece of equipment starts to come to the end of its useful life, and by useful life, I, I guess I define that as when it starts to break down regularly. It's at that point that you, you know, you might be able to fix it, but you might be spending time doing it and it slows it down. It's at that point, you're better off having it as your backup and getting a new piece of equipment that you turn it on and it runs immediately. Um, so the area that I am in Sydney, we have a lot of stairs. So that's why I have a battery powered lawnmower. They have a couple of advantages. They're light and two, the rear wheels hang out over the chassis, which means you can roll it up and down a set of stairs and not scratch stairs. While with uh, a lot of the petrol powered lawnmowers, the wheels are actually slightly forward of the rear chassis, which means anytime you're trying to go up and down a set of stairs, you're actually scratching stairs. So that's part of my reason for that. Um, in terms of range anxiety for, um, for batteries, you just have lots of batteries, right? It's, it, it, it's as simple as that. Um, you just come home at the end of the day, you just put them in the charger and then you pick them up first thing, pick them up in the morning as you as you head out again. Um, so that's that. Look, the, the hedge trimmers, I think are absolutely fantastic as battery powered. They don't drain the batteries very quickly and they're so much quieter, particularly when you have to hold them up above your head so that they're close to your ears and those sorts of things. Um, whipper snippers, um, just before I started to get into using the battery powered stuff, I brought two of the new um, two-stroke uh, whipper snippers. So they're both still running. So I, I have used them in the past and I have I don't have any issues with the battery powered, but I've got a legacy issue of uh, petrol in terms of my um, of my whipper snippers, but I will I will adjust those to um, to battery powered. Um, and then the, the final one is blowers. Um, the battery powered blowers work just as well as a petrol powered one. However, on maximum power, they run the batteries out very quickly. So the issue with them for my mind is not their power, it's the fact that they drain the batteries, which means you've got to have a lot more batteries. That's the only issue that I have with the, with the battery powered blowers. Um, I, I keep one because sometimes you end up in a situation where you, you don't want to have the loud um, leaf blower going, and you want to have have the the battery powered one. But that's my only, that's the only issue I have with them. I know certainly some guys um, have absolutely committed to being hundred percent battery and love and love it. So, and what sort of brands are you running, Simon? Everyone will ask um, brands. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, in terms of my mower, it's a Honda two one six. It's the you know the big big heavy duty work work the big heavy self propel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, it goes through. It goes through wet grass. It, 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 it does pretty much anything you need it to do, but it is big and it's heavy. Uh, I run, I'm now running Ego in terms of my, uh, my, my battery powered blower, my battery powered lawnmower, and one of my telescopic hedge trimmers. And my other telescopic hedge trimmer is still. And my, uh, my blowers are both still. And the, um, and the other one is, oh, my, my whipper snippers are Shindawa. Uh, and I, I have used Shindawa petrol powered tools for most of most of my time with it, and have been fantastic. I oh, know, awesome. And I was going to say, um, 
in your area, are people running trailers? Are they running utes? Are they running vans? What's the setup? Because people might be going, oh, geez, I couldn't fit a trailer in my street. So maybe you want to talk about the setups. Yeah, look, certainly. Um, uh, for, for those of you that don't know, the eastern suburbs and lower North Shore, you struggle to park a Fiat Pinto in some of our areas. So um, turning up with a trailer can be quite difficult. So most of us go with either a ute or with a van uh, in terms of that. A few people still have trailers so that when you end up with a garden cleanup of some description or where you've got a large amount of green waste to get rid of, they bring a trailer, disconnect it, put it in a driveway, fill it up, then reconnect and be able to do it that way. Um, so that so people still might have access to a trailer or you might just hire one for, the, for a day to be able to do that. But predominantly, we run vans and utes. Um, the trend of recently has probably been more towards vans than utes. The main reason that I can work out for that is that most utes these days on a single cab only have two seats. They've both now got bucket seats in the front which means you can only ever have two people while most vans have three seats across the front. It's not necessarily where you want to sit for a long trip, but if you're going, spending five minutes going from job to job, it's absolutely fine. So most people are sort of doing a van. With a van, you must make sure you get a vapor barrier between what you're storing in the back and the actual cabin. Mm. And most of them come with, if not standard, it's certainly uh, an optional extra that they're all familiar with. No, oh, great. Now, I want to ask you about, um, we get this question all the time, purchase price. When someone sees a big chunk of money and buys a Jim's Mowing franchise, maybe you want to tell people what they get for their money? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, look, I guess the most important thing that you get is access to the brand. That is the, that's the, most, in, that is the most important thing. Um, the brand is incredibly powerful. Um, we turn up in uniform and people are comfortable. Um, they get they get that you're part of that organization yes we have things that we need to be able to do to, to support that but it's ultimately you're getting access to the brand what does that that gives you it gives you the gym systems it gives you some technology it, and some software it gives you access to the call center it gives you access to the web the website gyms gets you leads or work right um, that is generally speaking not the reason that anyone will struggle. It is because we get sufficient work for you to be able to be able to do that. So we can get you work, and then the brand will help you win that work, so that you can end up with a regular group of customers that you can count on every month of the year, that you can continue to go and service them for years and years and years. Um, that's the that's the most important thing. Now, when you're also buying into that, into it. Uh, you will generally get access to um, five days training, sorry, six days training in Melbourne. And that is at the National Training Centre down in Melbourne. It's a fantastic time down there. You spend three days together with everybody who is currently joining the gyms group. And then you'll spend three days with other people, in our case, mowing and talking about mowing specific. I, I guess I call them hints and tips and and all the all the safety, all the things you need to be able to do to get started with with mowing. You then get five days in the field training, so you will then go out with a working franchisee and actually experience what it's like working, training, learning to quote, learning how to use the equipment, you're learning how you have the safe the safe packages. You will have a uniform pack that will get you started, so you'll have enough. You know, you have uniforms that you'll be able to get going you'll have a safety pack that you will also have that will be able to get you up and running so that you can operate your business safely from day one. You'll have a marketing pack that will have business cards and pamphlets um, available to you <clears throat> as well. So again, you can do that. And we talk to you about good ways of being able to put your name and your, your brand out in the local suburb that, you, that you're there. The other thing that you get is a non-exclusive territory. Now, most people, when they first hear that, think that that's a bad thing. I have always thought about it as actually a good thing and probably the best thing about joining the gyms group. And by non-exclusive, what it means is that you can work anywhere in Sydney. You, in my case, or in anywhere in Australia, you can choose where you work. When you have a territory, you get whatever leads come through the gym system, be that through the call centre or through the website you get first right of refusal for that work. 
So it comes to you and you go, yeah, look, I'm too busy to be able to do that. Someone else can then take that lead and do that, even though it might be in your territory. But the advantage of it is, is that you can work anywhere in Sydney. What I always say to our franchisees and prospective franchisees is you are not in competition with other gyms mowing franchisees. You're in competition with everybody else. And the more gyms franchisees that we have, the more work we get in an area. Um, so you will get to know your local franchisees and you can work, you'll work with them. You'll even do jobs together with them at various points in time. So you're not in competition with other gyms, you're in competition with everybody else in terms of that. Um, so that's the, that's the main thing. And you didn't get access to franchisors who are local. You know, all our franchisors are local um, and can provide you with local support. They'll understand the local conditions. Um, some, not everyone, but quite a few of us work in the local area as well. So it can help you out with that side of things. Uh, thanks for that information, Simon. That's, that's really brilliant. And that's a really great summation of the Jim's Mowing franchise offering. And I love what you said at the start was the brand, because I think the brand is underestimated because every year that we go by, if the brand, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And you can buy a part of like, you know, 96% brand equity for a really small fraction of the cost of what you could buy something else, which has the same amount of brand awareness. So it just keeps getting stronger. And I think people don't understand that enough. And you know that because no, in the field. Yeah, no, no, look, it, it, it is. It's, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly important. Um, when, when you talk to a customer, um, particularly a new customer that, that's come out, they'll go, oh, you're part of gyms. Instantly, you can see them relax, that they understand that they're, that it's part of a, of, of a bigger organisation, but I'm actually dealing with the person who's going to be responsible looking after the work. You know, I think it's such an undersold thing. And I just think it's, um, you know, for anyone looking at the business, it's the cheapest brand, well-recognised brand you can literally buy a part of and be a, a part of and leverage off all that, those millions of jobs that have been done previously and all the goodwill of that. And you can buy it at a really small fraction. Compare that a to, fraction, let's say, absolutely. Yeah. McDonald's or something like that. Now, Simon, just before we let you go, you provide a lot of really, really good information. It's been fantastic. A bit about yourself, mate. So what do you do in your free time? You mentioned you used to play footy, but what do you, what do you, what do, you do in your free time when you're not running a business? Uh, in my free time business, uh, I'm, I, I like to race sailboats. So uh, I like to get out on the water. Um, being in Sydney, we've, we've got the harbour and the Pacific Ocean out there. So I like to, to do yacht racing is my, uh, is my main passion away from away from working so uh, i never seem to get out of the sun that's the that's the problem my skin my skin doctor is uh, organizing another <laughs> a bigger boat yeah are we going to see jim's mowing in the um sydney to hobart uh no however <laughs> uh, one however one day um when i get myself organized enough together and i get my own boat you will see a jim's mowing sponsored boat cruising up and down the harbor so be awesome probably you know, won't be, it, it probably won't be big enough to Enter the Hobart, but um, maybe some of the lead-up events. That'd be awesome. Now, um, just before we get to let you go, what's maybe some advice for someone maybe who was in your position 20 years ago? Because you said your dream was owning a business and you didn't, you know, you're 20 years, you probably had that dream in the back of your mind. So what's yep. your advice for someone who maybe is in that same position now? I, I won't tell you just to do it, but I will tell you to go and talk to one of the franchisors about it, right? Do not be afraid to pick up the phone, have a an hour, an hour and a half meeting with one of the franchisors to understand what the gym's model is all about. You can read all the, you can read all the stuff online. You can look at the videos, sit down with a franchisor and just spend that time with them talking about the business, about what a gym's mowing business is about. Yeah, now, it's a good, it's a good point. So I was going to carry off just because I want to point out to people, it's not a hard sell. Like you guys aren't salesmen. You guys are franchisees. You're working in it like you are. Or the franchise all they're dealing with will have been a former franchisee in some capacity. So it's not a slick salesman, it's actual working people. Being, being that we've, we're, all, we're all either doing it or have been there and done it, we, under, we understand it. Um, and yeah, it's not, look, it's not for everybody. If, if you don't like dusty being outside in the sun or if it's damp or dust, then it may not be for you. Um, and again, that's part of why we have that, that uh, day or a half day where you come out in the field before you go too far down the track to see what the work's really like. Oh, brilliant, mate. Well, we'll leave it there today. And thank you very much, Simon. And if someone wants to inquire with you, 131546 or jimsmiling.com.au. And if they are in your area, hopefully they can come out and spend a day with you and meet you. Absolutely. 